Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Oakley Capital Investments a Full Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we will send you an email to notify you when they're ready for you to review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll and if you could uh, give your attention, uh, that would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Stephen Treasure. Good after, good morning, Stephen. Um, hi, Mark. Um, thank you for inviting me to join today. And thank you for all those that are, that are joining us online. Um, apologies, um, there is no official um, connection to me today, so you're, you're, you're at least lucky on that front. Um, so as Mark said, my name is Stephen Treasure. I'm a partner at Oakley Capital. And, and in short, Oakley Capital manages private equity funds. And the public company we're here to talk about is Oakley Capital Investments, or OCI. And that vehicle invests in the funds that Oakley manages. And that allows private investors like you or I to gain exposure to private equity returns to the stock market. So as described, OCI is what, what is known as a direct listed private equity company. And that's in contrast to a fund of funds. And it's com comparable to peers like 3i, HD Capital Trust, uh, and APAT Global Alpha. Um, so turning to our first slide, and, and to give you an immediate flavor of the type of businesses that OCI gives you access to, um, I've pulled up three, um, three pictures here that really represent the kind of companies that are key to our investor, investment themes. And that first picture there is a, a lady who um, is staring at an advertising board, but essentially she is studying online and um, she is looking at the Career Partner Group's online software. And the Career Partner Group is Germany's largest and fastest growing university. And it's just one of the examples of digital businesses that make up the Oakley portfolio companies. It's achieved its growth thanks to its focus on online education. And it, and it provides um, designed for purpose, completely flexible student orientated learning. And as a result, in the three years since, we've, since we acquired Career Partner Group, student numbers, numbers have grown from 15,000 to 60,000. And EBITDA has grown threefold. It has been one of the largest contributors to OCI in 2020 um, as a result of its value growth. And I can confidently say it'd be one of the, most likely one of the biggest contributors to growth um, this year and, and next year as well. Moving to that second image there, that is um, the Gimondo Fitness app. Gimondo is part of the 7NXT um, group that we acquired recently. Um, and it's another example of a digitally native business. And another example of how when a business is, is constructed for purpose, that's its prime purpose to operate digitally, um, how, how much significantly better your operation is if you're try as opposed to someone who's trying to convert to the digital environment. They provide, they're the leading um, um, app of its kind in Germany and actually was Apple TV's um, app of the year. Um, and it provides guided online fitness um, subscriptions to a predominantly female user base, not over 90% of subscription based um, are female. And it has an incredibly extensive library of video workouts and, and training plans. Its, subscri its subscriber base in 2020 um, were close to doubled um, across that last 12 months. And it really pays to not just what's happened as a result of COVID, but also an increasing change in the preferences of people to exercise in the privacy of their own home and have the flexibility of, of training when they wish. And also with a wider group of, of kind of friends and, uh, and, and connected people. Um, and we think this is a trend we think is going to we can confidently predict we'll move in that, that direction. It's also, I think, one of the reasons why I draw, draw attention to it early on is that whilst Oakley's had an incredible reputation to date and track record to date of accessing great opportunities, 
the, the fear is your ability to continue to do so and continue to uncover value, particularly in companies that are now becoming quite highly rated. Um, and so I bring this up as one of my m- most recent um, investments, and it demonstrates Oakley's ability to repeatedly access attractive investments. And it does this thanks to a network of business founders that we'll, we'll talk about shortly. And third and finally on this page, that is a, that is a photo um, from the materials of Ocean Technologies Group. This is a group that we is, is an example of the, the buy and build platforms that we have created uh, at Oakley. Uh, and in this case, we've combined six companies together to, to build the kind of clear market leader in regulated maritime e-learning. So that essentially is providing your crew on board your tanker with the training, remote training they require um, in order to meet um, your compliance requirements. And what we've been able to do is is not only provide the dominant player and provide pricing strength for that group, but also start to expand the product that we can offer crew, not just in training, but hopefully moving into other areas of HR and support. That hopefully gives you a a flavor of the kind of businesses that um, we invest in and something of our investment strategy. I'm very aware that our audience today spans from those who know us very well, our existing shareholders, and some of them are being introduced to OCI for the first time. And so on that basis, I will cover off just briefly in the next 30 minutes, uh, the start of that period, why private equity? What is so appealing about this asset class? Talk a little bit about Oakley Capital's investment strategy uh, and how it continues to originate um, companies. And then um, we'll finish with an overview of the OCI's um, four-year results um, to December uh, and talk a little bit about the prospects of the business. Um, So why private equity? Um, Well, I've drawn, I've put three key reasons here on the screen. It's far from exhaustive, um, but but I think these are kind of three of the key reasons. One is the superior terms that this asset class has achieved. Um, I've put up two examples here. It's crude, but I've given you the foot fuel share of annualized over the last 10 years, which is about 6% compounded. Um, and I've put up the global private equity benchmark, which has grown at 14% annualized over the last 10 years. Now, the, the global private equity benchmark covers all of the, the PE world. So how does that look in terms of those that give you a listed access? Well, in fact, those are the LPX Europe, um, which is essentially the index of, of those companies listed here in Europe to give you PE access. And that's, that's performed in line, if not slightly, under the kind of global benchmark. I guess more importantly for this discussion, OCI has grown almost identically to the global PE benchmark on a one, five, and 10-year basis. So you've got superior returns and also the listed vehicles can give you access to that. The second point here I made is is value creation. And that really just kind of talks to the the difference in a public market investor versus a PE investor. Um, And that a PE investor is not only in in many cases, and certainly in in Oakley's case, taking a, um, a majority stake, it's taking positions on the board, it's taking, a, it's taking a meaningful role in the creation of value such that there is significant or at least a lot more control over the outcome than you might have if you were a public market investor. Um, and finally, on this page, um, PE increasingly captures a larger pool of companies. So it's representing a much greater investment choice and opportunity. We've put here just the stats. Um, that compared the US market when they were last kind of published at the end of 2019. But you can see, and if I was to bring up a chart of this kind, it would show not only is there a significant more private equity, but the trend is that the number of public traded companies is declining and the number of private equity backed companies is increasing. So so why why is that? Um, Well, well my epiphany came in 2016 when I was um, I was in the investment banking stockbroking world for a number of years, for, for nearly 15 years. Um, and in 2016, I had briefly um, driven up the M40 to present to the management of a private company, a successful logistics firm based in Solihull. And I confidently arrived in my city suit and tie to meet these gentlemen, to tell them all about the wonders of becoming a listed business. They should actually consider an IPO. And um, 
was well, quite laughed out the out the out the building, but it was very clear to them that the IPO was was very much a, a secondary second class option to the one of a of a private company. And as they described it, you know, as they described it to me, um, we'll pick up on the points they kind of relayed. Um, Back then in 2016, I should say at this point, 2017, I left the stock market and um, or stopped broking and joined Oakley Capital. Such was my experience. But but here's what why I think more companies are remaining private. I mean, firstly, kind of 10 years ago, if we were having this discussion, I mean, private equity, particularly here in the UK, was a relatively nascent industry. There is a lot more capital available now and easy, more easily accessed for companies of a certain size and develop than there ever was. So I think that's the kind of first reason. It's the choice that you now have as a, as a company. Secondly, if um, if it's not just getting access to capital, I think when you when you get a PE investor, one you're more often than getting a single investor. That is a much easier relationship to manage. But with that capital comes the expertise and support to help your business develop and grow. So it's less of a decision of, I just want money and where can I get it from? Oh, I just want to exit. Um, and this speaks a little bit to the second point and certainly one of the points made by that company back in 2016 to me is that you have significant information advantage as a private company, which you relinquish um, as a public company. And so then in contrast, to go public, you have to wrestle with the kind of headwinds of compliance, increased and regular reporting requirements, um, and the kind of investor relations that comes with that, the increasing cost of being public, you've got M&A restrictions, you have management incentive restrictions, and you have that pressure of live pricing, which you know I think leads to significant short-term pressures on businesses to behave and, and grow in, at all costs, which isn't always to the benefit uh, of a company. Um, so hopefully that gives a little sense of, of, of kind of maybe why private equity and why a vehicle like OCI you know, it, you know, provides uh, an interesting uh, opportunity. Um, here we we'll just touch on Oakley Capital and how it goes, at, you know, it goes about investing in what areas, what's its investment strategy, and how does it originate. So first off, it's just to kind of give you a sense of the scale and the jurisdictions and the sectors that the comp uh, that Oakley focuses on. Um, we have two fund families here, the kind of flagship fund. Fund one, two, three, and four. We're currently on, uh, on vintage number four, um, and the Origin Fund. They essentially have the same investment strategy, but they allow us to invest um, different sums of equity value into the businesses. Um, enterprise values we tend to target up to about four or five hundred million euros, so very much the mid market, and it goes down to the lower mid market. In terms of our geographic focus, it tends to be. Um, Western or Southern European, Southern European focus with particular expertise in um, Germany, Italy, um, and Spain, um, to name three. We're not exclusive to that region, but that's certainly where our expertise is and where the biggest connection of our um, kind of connection to business founders really kind of focus. Um, and then we focus on three sectors, and they are technology, consumer, and education. And when I when I reference those kind of sectors, they're obviously particularly broad churches, those three. Um, but technology covers, our, it starts in our heritage in kind of telecoms and web hosting and has evolved into a track record of backing technology-led business service solutions. And the other side of, of technology is really digital services. Um, and that is businesses that are really taking advantage of the ongoing shift from consumers to from traditional online, offline channels to online platforms. And online platforms for us is typically price comparison websites. Um, so for example, the, the money supermarket of Italy, for example, or Germany in the past, um, or real estate classified businesses, the right move of Southern Europe as an example. Um, in terms of consumer, that's invest, investments that capitalize on the value captured by that balance of power shift towards well-managed brands and the increasing ability of, of those brands and companies to trade directly and digitally with their customers. Um, and also we're really capturing the kind of power of social media led marketing. 
When it comes to education, we started off with premium schools um, with a group called Inspired. Um, and we've now really traveled across the kind of wide range of the, of the business um, sector. And that, is, that has included tertiary after school education, online education, as we've, we've referenced already, um, after school tutoring for children of school age in Germany, um, and career-based training. Moving on, we we'll touch, touch on origination, and I think just as important to how we originate, but our ability to still access value which I think is which is just as important. Um, and I've referenced it slightly already, but one of the key tenements of Oakley's success to date has been the fact that we have strong a strong network of business founders, individuals that have established businesses um, and, and want an investor to come alongside them to help them grow that business. And after having a level of success with us, they've done two things. They've actually gone on to invest in the funds themselves and have gone on to find additional opportunities for us to invest alongside them. In some cases, in the pool of 20 or business founders that we've backed, some of them we've now backed for the third or fourth time. Um, and I think the other key thing is, is actually, they've been, as I mentioned, in terms of going on to invest on the, in the fund, they've invested up to nearly 200 million euros of their, of their own funds into the funds that we manage, which creates a great alignment of interest. And it also reveals the unique and strong relationship we have and the partnerships we've formed um, with the individuals, the entrepreneurs that we have backed to date. I can't overstate that enough as being a kind of a clear differentiator for us. And then it's also alongside them and how we do our deals is the fact that we do not mind tackling complexity as a result of, of how we get in, involved in a transaction. And where might complexity be? I think a lot of transactions happen via a competitive auction. The company has been prepared, its accounts, um, its documentation, everything about it has been prepared perfectly in preparation um, for an exit, um, which will be competitively managed by a third party. In many of the cases that of the businesses we're looking at, there isn't a formal process in place. The business won't have been prepared in that manner it may be a carve out of an existing parent, and it means we have to get our, our hands dirty in order to, to put that transaction together. The significance of that is, is that we are often doing transactions that are off market. So 70% of the investments we have made to date have been uncontested. 40% of them have been carve outs. And that means we're able to unlock a significant amount of value in that process that will be unseen to anyone else at the moment or anyone if, if it wasn't part of a you know, it would be very different we have an information advantage to be very different if that was part of a competitive process i've also touched on this but it's very much about forming a new partnership the, the 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 owner of the business is not always looking for that moment of our entry to be a value maximization exercise they're not looking for the highest price necessarily they're looking for the right partner to provide them capital and help develop that business to the next stage of its growth in 85% of the cases, we are the first private equity investor um, that has come on board a business, which I think is significant. In fact, someone described it to me that, that, that Oakley tends to buy, build, and develop, grow businesses, which ultimately become the target of larger PE firms. Um, and then finally, I touched on it with Ocean Technologies, but the other way we can unearth value is in buy and build. That's, that's initially acquiring a platform um, in a fractured market and then unlocking value by buying smaller orphan assets to combine with that one and as a result lowering our, lowering our entry multiple. So that covers a little on the subject of origination. Here I picked out three of the investment themes um, which you'll typically see us play in. I would state up front that you know, the events of the last 12 months whilst have caused a lot of change and disruption, they certainly won't have affected how we we go about investing and what our targets are. Um, first up, I've kind of mentioned that kind of direct to consumer kind of theme. I've touched on this with Jamondo and with Career Partner Group, but there's this incredible opportunity now for businesses, particularly in, in areas where there hasn't been that disruption of a digital platform, and there are still plenty of industries where that's the case. Suddenly you are creating a frictionless, lower cost opportunity to trade um, with your own customer. 
you can finally and effectively measure your return on digital marketing. So from an, a professional investor like ourselves, it means we can actually understand and analyze the returns we can get from investing. And more importantly, companies now have the power of data about their customers. And that is one of the most kind of valuable commodities on the planet um, for, for a business um, and enables them to interact with them to know exactly what they purchase, when they purchase, what they respond to, and what they could potentially sell to the mix. Um, another key um, trend for us has been repeat play in different geographies. And that's often investing behind the digital disruption curve. To give you an example, Money Supermarket, as I mentioned before, in the UK is a, you know, it's a highly developed, it's in, in, a, it's in a mature market, and there'll be you know, limited scope for, for growth, structural growth in this market at the moment because it's highly penetrated. We first invested in, in price comparison websites in Germany, where it was significantly behind um, the maturity curve to the UK. And now we've been able to go on from there with our expertise to invest in Italy and, uh, and now subsequently across southern Spain in similar platforms where the penetration has been low. To give you a, a simple example of that, um, Facile is the leading price comparison website in Italy. One of, the, one of its leading verticals is car insurance. In the UK, 70% of car insurance is arranged or renewed on some form of online platform. In Italy, at least going into 2020, it was more like 12%. So we're not, we're not making a bet on the economic or cyclical cycle in Italy. We're making a bet on the continued penetration of a, of a platform of that nature. And we've certainly been able to enjoy the increasing adoption of a platform like that as a result of the events of 2020. And then finally, kind of buy and build in those fragmented markets. This is the opportunity, as we've done with web pros in, 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 in web hosting software, ocean technologies in marine e-learning, and econ in business service software in Iberia. We've built a sector champion. We've managed to kind of realize the synergies that come with the bolt-ons. We've increased the pricing power as we, as we bring competitors together to operate in one business. Um, and we've unlocked value by creating a kind of scale player. Moving on, just in terms of the Oakley's ability to kind of keep active during a disruptive year, it really, it really hasn't kind of um, slowed down the pace of investments or realizations for that matter. Um, there were significant realizations in the period and probably most notably as we go on to talk about was the, was the premium to the book value that those realizations were achieved. And also we've continued with investments. Um, there were four platform investments in the year and there's already been two new investments um, at the start of 2021. Um, we have a significant pipeline of opportunity, probably the largest pipeline we've had in our history. But I think the, the most significant stat about the size of the platform is that 70% of that, of that pipeline is made up of proprietary opportunities, i.e. they're ones that have been brought directly to us. We have unearthed through screening or we've unearthed through a kind of continued relationship with a business founder. COVID has, has provided a catalyst, but maybe not in the sense of like bringing us, you know, kind of distressed businesses that are in need of funding. It's more that maybe business models have been accelerated over the last year or so. And as a consequence, companies are now considering that next leg of growth, that next opportunity, whether that comes in um, uh, M&A, internationalization, maybe they now want to or need to grow a digital channel because of their experiences of last year, or maybe they just want the greater certainty of being part of a bigger group um, and therefore are up for the first time to being acquired. Whatever those reasons, we've certainly seen kind of COVID provide um, an extra source of opportunities um, over recent months. So let's turn to OCI and, and the full year results. Um, here on the screen, you'll see um, the, um, the, the kind of headline numbers, net asset value grown to 728 million and a NAV per share of 403 pence. I think what's pleasing about the performance is that total NAV return, which is the growth in the NAV plus the dividend paid, um, it's 18%. And I think what's particularly pleasing about that is that wasn't in a year where everything went right. 
of the 17 companies that we that were in the portfolio at the end of the year, seven of those, as we can we can touch on a little bit, didn't um, perform in line with their expectations. Some modestly and, and some significantly, but the fact that despite that we can still produce a return, a sustained return like this, that's in line with or slightly in excess of our five-year average. Um, I think that's reasonably commendable. Um, here it shows that kind of now progression over the year, uh, over the years, over the last 10 years. Um, and, I, and I wanted to bring this up because I think it just shows the progression that OCI has gone on um, in terms of those kind of early years when there was a, a lot of cash um, and for various reasons that provided a drag. You've also only had, you know, kind of one or two funds operating. And then from 2017, you see the maturing of the investment strategy. You see the maturing of the portfolio. You see a lot more regular investment and realization activity year on year. And you've seen that consistent growth um, start to bear out and the performance you've seen in the NAV over the last kind of five years. Here is, we, we, we talk about that growth in NAV, and I wanted to kind of highlight what I thought that, that the positive and negative impacts on the NAV have been over the last 12 months. First up, and I think most importantly, is the average EBITDA growth, the average earnings growth of the portfolio of companies. Um, there are, as I said, 17, and they grew at an average, earnings at an average 20%. Now, I mean, that is a respectable growth in, in EBITDA. It's, it's lower than you might expect um, for an Oakley, average Oakley portfolio company. Um, the last of the years prior to 2020, the average has been more like 28% and 30% in the, in, the pre, in the prior two years to 2020. But still, um, it's still respectable. And the biggest contributor in terms of performance was Career Partner Group, um, which added 34 pence per share to the NAV. The other significant driver to, to value is in exits. Um, and we had three significant exits in the period, and notably, they were an 89% premium to the book value. It's not unusual at the point of sale that there is a, um, a release of a value that you cannot necessarily guarantee or a multiple expansion, earnings multiple expansion that you can't guarantee so that you can't necessarily hold the companies at that kind of value. But when the exit comes along, you get that price discovery and you get the opportunity for uplift. It's a bit like the, you know, the uplift you see in an IPO um, when you get that kind of initial kind of pop of, of performance. Um, the average long-term, I'm not suggesting we're always going to get 89% premium. The average weighted um, premium since inception of all deals that we've sold has been 44%. So you can see, and we'll go on to talk about the discount we trade to NAP. There's a double discount there. because There's also the discount um, to, the, to the realized price that we ultimately go on to achieve. Uh, the OCI board has remained committed to a buy share buyback program. We bought back 18 million shares in 2020 at a significant discount to NAV, and that enhanced the, the NAV per share by 13 pence. I'll touch on this a little more, but seven of our portfolio companies kind of lagged our expectations. Uh, most notably, Time Out had a rescue raise in May of last year. Um, and for obvious reasons, with Time Out's kind of markets being closed and advertising slump, slumped, you see an impact to NAV there of, of 30 pence in the year. It was a positive that we had a large amount of cash going into COVID. We sold in selling web pros and inspired. Um, a large cash inflow came into OCI. Um, and whilst that was great when they had the uncertainty and the initial kind of lockdowns and the wave of COVID, now I think we consider it to be a drag on performance. Um, and I think key is seeing that cash deployed into the funds as the funds draw down. So here we've taken the 728 million of NAV and we've divided it into the three asset types um, if you like the currently prevail. Let's deal with that cash first. 31% um, of NAV at the year end. Um, it's, it's fallen slightly from there, but only slightly as a result of the investments that we've made since the year end, thanks to also there being a realization and a refinance. The long-term average um, for us is around of cash, the percentage of NAV is around that kind of 15, 15 to 20% level. And 
you should expect us to return into that um, range in the relative near future. As a result of the sale of those, of those assets, the Oakley funds themselves, we're currently got about 50% exposure to them. And that's what we really want to maximize the most exposure to. We've got the IRR there of the funds being about 26% net of um, net of all costs. In, in the last year, it was more like 36%. Um, so you can see that as much exposure we can get to the funds as, as, as possible, the better. Now, direct investments um, are, are investments that we've made directly into um, port existing portfolio company debt or equity. It was conceived as a strategy kind of a number of years ago when we had a lot of cash and we were deploying for the first time that making short term investments into, into those companies was a great way of reducing the cash drag. It has brought significant success over the period in terms of investing more in companies that have, that have outperformed. Um, but as we stand today, the IRR, the direct investments, lags the funds. And I think we've now got enough fund strategies to invest in, in terms of the flagship fund, the origin fund, um, that we're confident enough that there is enough ways for us to deploy the cash we have got into the fund. What this is saying is that our plan is to, well, is plan to stop new direct investments and to realize our existing ones. We won't be able to do it immediately. It's a process that's ongoing. The 150 million of direct investment at the moment has already fallen to 130 um, as a result of a realization. Um, and our plan will be to wind down. There's only really two outstanding ones. There's direct debt into North and a direct equity into timeout. Um, and certainly in the case of, of both, certainly in the case of North sales, you know, we would hope to be in a position to refinance North in 2022 uh, and to see the return of that capital. Um, I think that will achieve a number of things, and we'll maybe go on to talk about this particular point when we talk about um, the, um, the discount. But I think what we're hopefully looking at then in a year or two's time is 15 to 20% of the NAV in cash and 80 to 85% um, of the NAV in the Oakley funds. Here's a, we, we split the, um, the nav up differently here, and this is, this is showing you as an OCI shareholder your exposure to each of the 17 portfolio companies, the equity exposure to each of those companies. Of note is the um, relative even split um, between the kind of three sectors. Um, but I think probably more importantly, rather than the sectors, is the fact that over 70% of those companies deploy their products and services via some kind of digital solution. The other significant stat is a similar percentage, 71% of that portfolio um, enjoy some kind of subscription-based or recurring revenue. Or if they don't, in both those cases, if they don't necessarily deploy their services digitally or they don't have a subscription-based subscription revenue, then we identified the opportunity to introduce one. To provide some stats about those companies, I've already referenced the average EBITDA growth um, across the entire portfolio. I'd, I'd say that Fund 4, um, which is one of our newer funds, the average EBITDA growth in those companies we've identified more recently is, is 40%, which talks to how kind of strong the investment strategy is and how we've developed it um, over recent years. Average net debt EBITDA, I always think it's, it's good to kind of um, focus on that or feature it in that one of the concerns that private equity is generating its returns via over-reliance on debt and cheap debt. Um, this has been a pretty stable mul uh, multiple for us. I think it was 30, uh, 3.8 times net debt to EBITDA in 2018, 3.7 times in 2019, and 3.9 times. I think the more important feature of any kind of net debt multiple is, is the nature of the EBITDA, how fast it's growing, and more importantly, how much of that converts to cash. And when you're talking about businesses with a technology or um, digital bias, then there isn't a huge amount of cost other than kind of interest in tax that sits below EBITDA. So a lot of that, you know, fast growing EBITDA converts the cash and we're very comfortable with that level of, uh, of indebtedness. And it compares to the kind of average in, in kind of broader global PE being more like seven times. The EV, EV EBITDA multiple, I think, is, is notable in how relatively low it is, kind of just shy of 12 times EV EBITDA when you consider not just the growth that we achieved, average growth we achieved this year, 
but what the you know the the typical average growth has been in, in previous years in a non-COVID year. Um, that multiple hasn't increased. It was about 12.1 times um, this time last year and reflects the fact that they're not creating any of the growth by increasing the multiple of the earnings that we're, we're holding businesses in. Their value is increasing thanks to the, inc the growth in their earnings. Here we've divided up the portfolio into, into their kind of COVID impact um, buckets. Um, the the left-hand bucket there shows the businesses that have really either performed as expected or thrived in a, in, a, in a kind of lockdown environment because of their kind of digital solutions. To pick out some that have really outperformed in that period, um, I think any of the hosting businesses, it's certainly been the case whether that's Contabo, it's a host, hosting provider, or WebPros, which provides software into the hosting industry, um, both have performed incredibly well. WebPro is growing at um, north of 45, it's only north of 45% in that period. And you can imagine why, as more individuals and small businesses require more hosting requirements by virtue of the, the, the channels and the environment they now have to operate in. Um, the other outperformer um, was Wishcard. Um, that this provides, this is in Germany, this is Germany's leading retail gift voucher. Uh, and this is a voucher that you would acquire, you would purchase and give to someone and, and the recipient gets access to over a five, 500 retailers uh, in Germany. The reason it particularly spiked in terms of performance was because its channels, route to market, typically are kind of supermarkets, petrol stations, grocer, groceries, and they obviously were one of the few channels that remained open during the lockdown in Germany and still open today. Um, there is increasing adoption of a relatively new industry as well, which I think has, which has, which has helped. Uh, and as a result, you know, their voucher sales doubled over the course of the last year and has really accelerated the stage at which we're at with Wishcard, opening up kind of new opportunities sooner than we anticipated. Um, Ocean, I've touched on. Fatula is, is a great example of, of a business that has now benefited from the increased adoption of its services in Italy it actually, um, its business slowed in the first half of 2020 as there was less, um, you didn't have to reinsure your car in Italy during a lockdown. So clearly you didn't have to use Fatula or anyone during that period, but they've managed to catch up all that lost, that lost business and actually meet or slightly exceed expectations um, for the year. In that modestly impacted bucket, you've got companies where like Tech Insights, where they made their labs were closed during that period, where they do their analysis of of um, semiconductor equipment. Daisy and Econ, where they have not been able to get on-premise to deliver or implement um, a new um, customer kind of project, or customers have delayed their decision-making around taking on a new project. In this case, for Econ, that would be taking on a new um, software solution or moving from a license model to an in-the-cloud model, for example. Those, those bigger um, project decisions have clearly extended the sales cycle, and we imagine that as soon as kind of lockdown um, lockdown ceases in Spain, then then the business will pick up. Shuler Hill, for again, has, has has struggled as kind of schools have, have shut down. Shuler Hill for provides after school education. One of the real catalysts for Shuler Hill for was that you um, as a as a parent you were alerted a year in advance if your child is unlikely to meet the required grade. Um, in any given year. If they aren't, then they're held back a year. So it's quite a draconian process. And clearly, you're motivated to get up, to get additional tutoring for your child or in that position. If exams are stopped or there's any uncertainty around the, the exam grading system, then it removes that obvious catalyst. Also, of course, do you really want your child having to spend more screen time, uh, more school-based screen time? Probably not. Now, clearly, as we've emerged from lockdown and exams will be reinstated, um, then we expect the kind of business to pick up where it left off, although it may take a year to kind of catch up. Finally, there's those that have been significantly impacted. Time out as a list of business, they report their results on the 30th of March. At this point in time, uh, all the markets are closed and advertising has been hit. Um, but I think when we look to the months ahead, we see a number of things. One, obviously, the opening of the markets, the first of those markets opens in um, Miami in a couple of days time and we'd expect the, the remainder to open um, in late spring. 
Um, I think the other key thing with the markets business is our focus on management agreements. So rather than spending capital on opening our own capital and opening new sites, this is using the capital of real estate developers and us managing um, those sites for them. It's capital light. We get a guaranteed return. And also it's, it's, a, it's a recurring earning stream for time out, which I think will be positive. In terms of the impact on the OCI NAV, I kind of feel like the impacts happened of COVID. It's there. It's in the price. The share price of timeout sits at the, um, the price of the rescue raise back in May. And I think once you've got clarity over the opening up of um, the business again, once you've got clarity over, over any kind of future funding risk uh, of timeout, then you as an OCI shareholder have the upside of recovery, but there's not an awful lot of, you know, kind of, of impeding it can do to the OCI performance. Timeout's now, you know, circa 4% of now. North sales, again, was impacted by the fact that um, failing regattas um, have, have stopped. North sales is the pr provider of premium race sales. It also sells sales into the leisure market, but that's really its kind of strong sector position. Um, clearly, they're a bit like Formula One tyres. You know, you, you, the premium sale, expensive bit of kit, you can use them to race for a season, and then you have to replace them. Clearly, if racing stopped, then sale replacement cycles um, slowed. One area of North that did perform well was in kite and, and windsurfing as kind of individual um, outdoor um, activities were one of the few things that kind of prospered relatively in, in the kind of COVID environment. And the other thing that whilst it was, whilst there was a, um, whilst they're impeded by the fact that their retail networks were closed, that the, the North South's apparel business has, has managed to kind of grow its kind of wholesale sales, its online sales, and we emerge into 2021 with, with that area of the business now being profitable for the first time in quite a number of years. So the outlook for North is, um, is extremely positive for this year and beyond. That's a quick tour of the, um, um, the portfolio company. I recognize that we want to get to questions. Um, so I just touched on on one last day, which will no doubt feature in the questions. Now, I would preface this section by saying, the appeal for me of OCI is the fact that the portfolio companies are high in quality, they're growing, and it's the growth in NAV that I think is the thing that we have control over and provides the future, future value for any shareholder in OCI. And that's the basis I would encourage anyone to own the shares of OCI. And we're incredibly optimistic about the continued growth in those businesses. We can't avoid or, or not reference the fact that um, OCI's share price um, trades at a significant discount to the NAV per share, a, four, a 403 pence of NAV per share compared to nearly a three pounds um, of, of share price. So uh, roughly speaking today, about a 25, 26% discount. Now clearly, whilst we can't specifically control that. We can do whatever we can to try to close it and to, and to address the issues that, that may have led to causing it. Um, you can review this slide at, at, at your leisure, kind of post the presentation. But I wanted to outline here a lot of the issues that we, or the concerns that we identified back in 2017 when we really started um, to kind of focus on this point with OCI um, and the different measures that we've taken to address them from discounted share issuance and saying we'd never do that again from greater alignment of interest between the oakley partners of oakley capital and the oci board with them combined now earning over 10 percent of oci with return cash we have a share buyback program now which cancels the shares and is now you know kind of regularly buying back kind of year to year we've hugely increased our transparency this is no longer as with most listed p firms a black box there is clear visibility to the underlying businesses. Uh, we have a capital market today in which people can meet and interact with the, the CEOs of those businesses. Uh, and we provide as much detail as is, um, as is possible without undermining the kind of competitive advantage of those companies. Share concentra shareholder concentration has been a big issue. I mean, a few years ago, you know, top 10 shareholders owned north of 90%. Um, the top two shells owned over 55%. Uh, 
And essentially, that shareholder concentration for, for all kinds of reasons, fund managers leaving the industry, funds closing or changing their remit, we've had to turn over a lot of that register. And today, we have a much more sensible shareholder concentration and a much more suitable shareholder base. But that's taken a lot of time, a lot of indigestion to get through. And arguably, we're still get, you know, kind of just getting through the tail of that as a lot of buying interest has sucked into removing that. Daily volume is, has really started to improve. You know, it was, it was 500,000 a day in the last 12 months. Now, that was slightly skewed by some big block trades, but we're even witnessing that this year as more retail wealth managers and more retail participate in OCI shares, so we're seeing a healthier day-to-day trading in the shares. Um, we move from AIM to the SFS. We'll talk about a little bit more about the, the next move from there. The board has completely changed in its independent um, um, composition. Um, over the last kind of couple of years, and we removed all fees from the direct investments. So that leads us to what what can be achieved from here. Um, and these, I think, are, are some of the kind of outstanding issues that we can address. First of all, is those direct investments. I think they create focus around the businesses that are not the the strongest. They're not the outperformers of the business um, in time out and north. Now they could be. They, they know that will prove to be great investments but they're certainly not the kind of the champions of the funds, the greatest hits of the funds that really should, should draw attention to. Secondly, they're a drag on performance compared to the, the cash in the funds. And thirdly, they create a concern around conflicts of interest. Is, is it in OCI's best interest to invest in those companies, provide debt to North South, or is it in the company and, and Oakley's best interest? If we resolve that, if we remove that element of doubt, I think that would be significant for OCI. Uh, and we hope that's something we'll be in a position to do by 2022. We have traditionally reported our NAV on a half yearly basis. Um, and I think one of our concerns is, is that only giving two um, points in a year when we update on NAV is too few um, and also creates kind of, you know, often you find sellers wait for those particular points. Um, and as a result, you don't see the share price track with the NAV growth. Our plan is, as soon as, as we're able to, is to move to quarterly reporting. And when we do, we'll be talking about, you know, maybe unlike our peers, but going for a full revaluation of funds on a quarterly basis. The earliest we hope to be able to instigate that is from um, Q3 onwards. But it's certainly, if it's not then, it will be soon afterwards, which I think will be helpful. Yes, we move to the SFS, the specialist fund segment, um, but not all retail platforms, and that includes Barclays and Halifax um, are permit their um, their customers to, to trade on SFS under the under the best that it is for expert investors only. Now most platforms allow you to confirm you're an expert investor and trade on the SFS, but two two don't, and that you know, clearly obviously restricts some investors participating. Our, our aim is to move to the main list. We weren't able to move because primarily because of the concentration of the investments. They, the listing authorities view it on a basis of concentration in funds as opposed to the underlying portfolio. When we moved to SFS, we only really had two funds where our, our OCI's kind of capital was concentrated. The hope is in a year or so's time, there'll be a much more, with a large number of funds, there'll be, diverse, there'll be diversity um, in um, and investments, and that will allow that move to the main list, which I think will be helpful. And the other thing is investor profile. I mean, we, despite the fact that we perform pretty much in line with, if not better than our peers, and I mentioned them earlier, three I Apex and HG. You know, we we change in the top three across a one, three, and five, but we're pretty much similar. And yet, each of those three now trade at a, at, at or a premium to their NAV, and we trade at a 25% discount. So clearly, you know, we're just not as well known. I think our, our performance is not as well understood. Um, and I think that's something that is, that is shifting. And we are doing a lot more communication, engagement. A meeting like today is a, is a great example of that. So to, to conclude the presentation today, um, I'd like to kind of touch again on that 18% um, NAV return and the fact that it's achieved in a year of disruption. Key to that performance and the ongoing performance is that over 70% of the portfolio delivers its solutions digitally. 
I think in order to give you confidence about our ability to continue to repeat that performance in terms of the new investments, we've got that, that large proprietary pipeline of over 150 opportunities uh, that we're currently reviewing. And whilst I don't necessarily, I can't guarantee you that this discount will close or when it will close, I'm confident it will, but clearly we've got a program that's set out to continue to address that discount. And I can see the appeal of it. If the, if the NAV grew at 85% and the discount closed, your shareholder return will be high 50s, nearly 60% for, for 2021 if it's achieved. Now, um, who, who knows when and where, but we know that APAX was trading at a double, um, a double digit discount you know, not that long ago, and now it's trading at a small premium. Um, so that draws the presentation to a close. That's brilliant. Thank you very um, much indeed, Stephen. Sorry to uh, cut you across. I, I was only going to say that um, obviously there's a number of questions coming in. So just whilst you take a few seconds, um, ladies and gentlemen, could I please ask you to continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. But just while Stephen takes a few moments to review investor questions submitted already during the meeting itself, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation along with the copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet Company dashboard, and we will send you an email again uh, telling you when that's ready for you to review. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, Stephen, I know that's not an awful lot of time to give you, but um, I don't know if you've clicked on the Q&A tab just on the right-hand side of your slides. Um, can you see those questions? I have, there? yeah. Perfect. I do, if, yeah. if I could possibly ask you to read out the questions and who it's from and give a response where it's appropriate to do so. And if I start at the top, if you start at the top and I'll meet you at the bottom, um, and then, as I say, we'll, we'll look to redirect investors. Um, we're coming up to, to the hour, but feel free to, to take on as many questions as you've got the time to, uh, to give today. Um, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I'll go through. There's, there's, quite a, there's quite a lot of questions here. I'll go through them as quickly as I can, some of which hopefully we've already tackled as part of the presentation. Um, and if there's a possibility to, um, to, to speak with any of you kind of privately, then I'm happy to take up any points if I've not um, addressed them in full. Um, first off, um, Yusuf asks if, uh, if, um, if I can talk about the trading performance of the timeout markets. Uh, anything uh, on north sales. So I've, I've touched on the fact that um, the markets currently are closed, that Miami is due to open this week, and that the rest of the markets we should hope should open between May and June um, of this year. Um, Rari N, he asks, um, how do you see the current investment opportunity set in the UK versus the other markets that you look at? Um, Look, we've, look, we're based here. We don't have a, a UK base. We're certainly not averse to investing in the UK. I think one of the two things that we find with the UK is, is that one, there's a lot of, there's a lot of PE competition here. It's, it's a mature private equity market and therefore there's a lot of competition. And therefore it's harder for us to find two things, which is value and for us to have information advantage. Now that's not to say that we wouldn't invest in the UK if we found those opportunities. And we certainly are within our pipeline on a number of UK opportunities. But I think you're more likely to see a still bias towards um, kind of Western and, and Southern Europe um, going forward. Um, EMB asks, is Brexit a long term plus or minus for the Oakley business? I mean, I think Oakley, o Oakley Capital as a PE operator, um, I think our ability to do our job you know, hasn't kind of really changed. We've got a Munich office, we're opening a Milan office, and we have a London office. So I think we're kind of spread in terms of our ability to take advantage of any opportunities that come up um, as a result of Brexit or otherwise. Our ability to continue to operate for London you know, hasn't been um, impacted. The funds themselves um, are administered out of Luxembourg. So that certainly doesn't change anything for us. If Brexit is going to create some disruption and opportunity, then we're absolutely um, in, a, in a very strong position um, to be able to take advantage of that. So whilst day to day, I'd say it's neutral um, for, for the prospects of Oakley and the portfolio companies, I think that if it does provide opportunity, then we'll be well positioned to take advantage of it. Paul S says, please define a dividend strategy. Um, 
it's we are basically committed to maintaining the four and a half pence of divvy that we that we started in 2016-17. The mentality behind that is that the general feedback from our investors is that they'd much prefer the return of cash via buyback side dividend. Now that's not going to be the same for everyone, um, and different people have different um, different tax um, focus. Um, but that is generally our, 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 our chosen approach for the time being. But we have committed to re, re, at least maintain that four and a half pence annually. John A asked how you're going to reduce the discount to NAV, and, and hopefully that final slide has tackled the kind of main ways in which we're going to address that. Um, John A says, how long is the average holding period? and What is the average ROI from each holding? Um, John, the average holding period of a realization is about three and a half years. And the average holding period of the portfolio to date is about three years. Um, the average return on investment, um, I don't have... I don't have that number exactly to hand. I know that the minimum we require is 25%. Um, and I'll, um, I'll come back to you, John, if I may, on the exact average um, to date since inception. Um, John, I also asked, could you elaborate on why actually historically has had more European opportunities? For an investor who doesn't know until today, I'm surprised about the diversity of the geographical portfolio. I wonder why the UK proportion has been a low share. This is not a complaint, but an observation. Um, John, hopefully I've touched on this to some extent. I think we found that there was less value opportunities available to the, in the UK in a, in a market where PE has proliferated for a number of years. Um, and there's been more value opportunities, and, more, and certainly our ability to invest in less mature markets, learn from what we knew about um, the UK and to some extent, you know, kind of Germany and look to see the same opportunities, but at an earlier stage, develop in other countries. Um, again, in our pipeline is a number of UK opportunities. It, you know, it, it's about the strength of the investment opportunity, not about the region. It certainly isn't. It certainly is a, a decision not to invest in the UK. Um, and also, the more you invest in a region, the more you gain trust and profile with the, with the business owner operating that area, the more expertise you get about understanding that landscape uh, and the opportunities that surround it. And so one successful deal just typically leads to another business founder uh, relationship and a knowledge of more opportunities. So the more you do in a region, the more you then tend to do in a region, if that makes sense. Richard A said, are you aware that Halifax shares in their wisdom do not allow investment in the stock? And yes, we do. Uh, and we know that's because they restrict um, trading on the um, specialist fund segment. We have lobbied them to change and they have chosen not to. Um, and in time, by us moving to the, to the main market, we'll hopefully resolve this particular problem. Yusuf S asked, do you see a discount with narrow if the management presented the results directly and answered questions directly, we don't see the management very often. Well, the, well, the management of the companies, you know, clearly, you know, there there is a lot of those. There's there's now 19 of those, um, and we, you know, we as OCI or the manager or actually capital, you know, kind of sit between them. It's their job to manage the business, not to report to a wider audience. We do make them available. They do present. Um, during the capital markets days. So that is the opportunity we've kind of focused um, them on, on doing that. And, uh, and certainly you know, where required, you know, we will start maybe, maybe um, producing more films with them. So there's an opportunity for you, to, for you to have them speak more directly about their businesses. The, the challenge is as we grow in scale, there is just a lot of those companies. Um, and there is just the feasibility of having them having them present. It's a bit like the CEO of a business, and and you know, us, you wanting to speak to all the senior management that head up all the verticals underneath. It, it's just it's just difficult for that to be a practical um, solution. John A asks, when you sell the investments, what kind of percentage do you expect or typically see in terms of selling positions, private sales, flotations? Okay, so to typically to date. Most of our most of our exits are private. In fact, more specifically, they've been to private equity. 
And I think that reflects a couple of things. Private equity can move very quickly. There is a lot of dry powder in that kind of large global private equity fund base. And flotations do suit some companies. And it's certainly at the time suited time out. But I think that will be a rare exit for us um, unless there is a real compelling reason to go down that route. Um, Bill H asks, how big is OCI in terms of the total assets managed by the Oakley Capital Group? Um, the total assets under management um, are about 4 billion euros, uh, and the total asset base of OCI is 428 million. Bill, typically, you would expect um, OCI to be broadly somewhere between 20 to 30% um, of a new fund in the future. Um, John A. asks, could you give a short summary why I should invest in Oakley compared to your peers? Um, I, I think the, the three obvious peers that I've, that I've highlighted, 3i, HG, and, um, and APAX, I mentioned those three because they're the obvious direct listed PE peers. They also have, particularly in the case of APAX and, and HG, they also have a kind of tech digital kind of software bias. Certainly, it's, it's you know, more focused in, in business software for an HG. Um, and as a result, you've seen similar performance across those, those businesses. Um, I think if we have a, an edge on them, um, and quite frankly, I would happily invest in, in, in all of those, in all three of those companies. If we have an edge, it's in the way we originate. It is a distinct um, advantage. And in fact, if anything, an HD or an Apex might be an acquire of one of our assets rather than someone we compete against. And look, you know, they're in a position where they're currently trading at, at NAV or above their NAV, and we are, we are trading below. As I say, I would ha happily own OCI today for its NAV growth, but you do have that you know, additional option. Um, Bill H asks, now that you're running down your direct investment, OCI is becoming just like another private equity fund of funds. Um, why would it be better long term to invest in a fund like Harborvest? Well, I, well, I think it's still very much a direct. It's a direct. We're investing only in one um, one manager. It's very clear the specifics in which geographies we're investing in. For that, historically, directed PE companies have outperformed fund of funds. If you want greater diversity and you want thousands of underlying portfolio companies and you want a greater geographic diversity and you want more sector diversity, then you absolutely should um, invest in a fund of fund. Um, but I don't think, I think they both provide good opportunities um, and you have a more clearer defined investment strategy within a direct, um, in a, in a direct um, vehicle. Roger S asks, what are the challenges in valuing portfolio companies? Uh, well, look, I guess they're significant. I mean, fundamentally, there is a third party which essentially evaluates and confirms all our values. So it's, it's a process which ultimately is concluded out of our hands. The problem you have is particularly it, it, it's finding the appropriate peer group in order to, to value against. Now, of course, one of the things that we we talk about with private equity is getting access to private companies into sectors which may not be reflected on the public market. So there isn't a necessarily a public peer group to, um, to, to invest against. Um, and uh, I, I guess in addition to that is, is that one of the challenges as well is, is that you, you typically are pegged to the, to the value that you, the multiple you bought the business at, but as you well know, when we come to exit it, we realize um, we realize a big uplift in the, in the multiple. I apologize, there is at least 10 more questions um, and I unfortunately have to, to move on um, that's, to the next investor presentation. Um, Stephen, that's absolutely no problem. And, 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 and again, thank you to those investors that have submitted those questions. We'll, we'll obviously make all of these available after and if there's anywhere you feel it's appropriate to answer, of course, we can um, uh, publish that alongside the ones that you've answered during the meeting itself. Um, I know investor feedback is important, perhaps ahead of, um, I, I guess, closing the session, perhaps I could ask you for a few words to wrap up. And then, as I said, our diver investors to give feedback. Uh, Mark, look, I mean, I think, I think hopefully in that overview, 
you've you've got a sense for the investment strategy of, of Oakley Capital, um, the strengths of the positioning of those businesses, and where we hope earnings growth will return to um, this year and following. Um, I think the prospects for the Oakley funds and therefore OCI looking extremely, extremely strong at this point, and we have sufficient cash to deploy into those funds as they as they make those investments. We recognise there are there are, there is a a worthwhile program to continue with in order to help close that, that discount. But in the meantime, um, we hope to continue growing NAV and to welcome you, more of you as shareholders. Stephen, thank you very, very much indeed for, for your time today and uh, your presentation. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you access this meeting via our website, the feedback page will appear. But if you access the meeting via the link sent you by email, just simply click on the link and uh, it will ask you to, to submit your thoughts and expectations. Um, on behalf of the management team of um, Oakley Capital Investments, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for attending today's webinar. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all and thank you for your time.